Italian Communists Inside Stalin's Gulags. This is from the ICT website, and it is translated from Prometeo in, um, from 2007. 1936, 1937, 1938. It was during the course of these three years that the Stalinist regime wiped out the entire Bolshevik old guard, as well as every form of class opposition by means of its notorious show trials. In fact, the obscure work of the Troika, or rather the three-member commissions charged with persecuting or prosecuting, judging, and condemning the accused, had begun well before and would continue long after. This historical course had already opened a decade earlier with the ejection of Trotsky from the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party and his subsequent banishment. They were the years Victor Serge memorably defined as the midnight in the century. Italian communists emigre to Russia were caught up in all these trials. Their history has often been conveniently underreported or misreported, in line with the opposing, though convergent, interests of Italian Stalinism and the anti-communist bloc. It's worth remembering that it is only since the 1990s that the Russian archives have been accessible. Since then, a whole series of publications have seen the light of day, most of them in the so-called academic world. Obviously, we are aware that historical truth, whether or not the historian is writing in good or bad faith, is always partial. But at the same time, we believe we should pay tribute to those comrades who, during outbreaks of collective madness, would often pay with their lives for the communist mil militancy. Those of us who are today struggling for the same cause must try to understand with hindsight and therefore more clearly the historical process which the comrades who became victims of persecution experienced directly and which probably made them unable to grasp the essence of the matter. First of all, the numbers, even if the sources give different and contradictory figures. Some estimates are only for those who emigrated to the USSR illegally and under false names. It is estimated that there were about 4,000 Italian residents in the USSR in the 30s, including the 3,000 strong community of Italian origin in the Crimea, dating back to the 18th century, which was not strictly politicized, but was strongly affected by the repression. Of these, around 100 suffered some form of repression in the Stalinist period, according to the PCI, after de-Stalinization. However, it would be better to reckon a thousand, as estimated by recent historical research. From 1922 to 1928, there were 600 Italian political expatriates, at least according to the data of the fascist authorities. Almost all of them went via France or Switzerland, where they could wait for the chance to go to the USSR. As a rule, they were comrades who had had a run-in, often armed, with the military police, the fascist squads, and with the special tribunals. They had all been militants since 1921, with revolutionary fortitude and honor, as they used to say in the language of the time. About 250 were shot in the notorious Lubyanka and Butovo prisons, or else were to die from starvation and malnutrition in the various gulags, where they served their sentences. Very few of the survival survivors have ever explained what happened to them. According to the Encyc Encyclopedia of the Resistance and Anti-Fascism, edited by La Pietra from 1926 to 1943, the special tribunals condemned 40 pe 42 people to death. 31 were carried out only four of which applied to Italians, the rest being directed against Yugoslav partisans. In general, you came out alive from fascist prisons. An exception to this was Gramsci. On the other hand, many of the 1,100 imprisoned German communists were liquidated in the gulags, while in 1939, 500 of them were donated to the German SS as part of the Nazi-Soviet pact. On arrival, every immigrant had to fill in a questionnaire, the Anetka, specifying his own background, ideas, and political affiliation. This was then kept in the archives of the International and regularly updated according to the reports of the numerous spies, informers, etc. 
Thus, the Italians were very soon asked if they knew Bordiga, if they had had any association with him. If so, what kind of relationship? And what did they think of his removal from the party leadership? Bear in mind that the celebrated exchange between Bordiga and Stalin at the enlarged executive of the Inter International took place on February 15th, 1926. From then on, every Italian was suspected of Bordigaism. During the interrogation, the accused was asked to account for things said or done even 10 or 15 years earlier. The objective was to make him give in, capitulate, force an act of submission towards the party, which was presented as an organism that could never be wrong, and hopefully to induce him to join the ranks of the spies, infiltrators, or provocateurs, well paid though, and get others drawn into the trials. Naming other counter-revolutionaries was one of the things most appreciated by the investigators and would put an end to the ordeal. KRTB. This was the acronym of on the sentence ticket of a good many of them. It meant counter-revolutionary Trotskyist Bordigist and carried with it the most severe punishments, the hardest work and the smallest food rations. In the gulags, the political detainees were placed under the authority of common criminals who were delegated by the camp administrations to run the daily life of the camps. An obvious corollary is that many more communists were to die in Stalin's prison camps than in the fashion, fascist prisons. If there were only this to go on, for a revolutionary today to still speak of anti-fascism is tantamount to disarming oneself in front of the class. The historical context in which these events occurred should also be taken into, into account. The first five-year plan, 1928 to 33, with its collectivizations had revealed itself to be a disaster. Millions of peasants were flooding into the cities where there were already enormous problems with food supplies. They lived miserably on the streets, surviving by begging and various other expedients. So many were they that in order to try and stem the flow, internal passports were introduced for traveling from one locality to another in the country. Meanwhile, in the factories, work rates were constantly being increased while wages remained inadequate. Then the Uderniki appeared, that is to say the assault workers who finished up being well paid on the basis of the production quotas they had reached. But in general, life was very hard. Just imagine, two months wages were not enough to buy a hat, an indispensable item to survive the very long and very hard Russian winters. Housing was another problem. For the party functionaries, there were the hotels, suitably kept under surveillance. But for the workers, the maximum they were entitled to was cohabitation with other families. If that had been tolerable in the name of war, communism, after 15 or 20 years of the revolution, it was less so, especially as freedom was becoming more restricted for some, whilst others were finding career opportunities open, opening up for themselves in the party or the state industries. The celebrated writer Victor Serge was one of the first to be arrested in 1928, together with many other members of the opposition. He then spent three years in Siberia before being expelled from the USSR in the spring of 1936. In 1927, the old Bolshevik Adolf Joff, then Commissar for Foreign Affairs, committed suicide in protest against Stalinist methods and policies. Workers' discontent along with the agricultural and food supply crisis provoked tensions inside the Bolshevik party, and it seems a plan was being hatched to remove Stalin from the post of party secretary. Then in Petrograd, Kirov, president of the city Soviet, was assassinated on the on the 1st of December 1934. This was the signal to Stalin, in effect gave him the mandate to launch an all-out anti-Trotskyist campaign which would sweep through the party ranks, both inside and out. In a few days, around 40,000 people were arrested in Petrograd alone. All those who had been expelled in 1927 to 28 for being oppositionists and who had then been readmitted a few months later with a simple word of warning were now rearrested. Stalin had ably adopted for himself the opposition slogans on collectivization, industrialization, thus hoodwinking many activists, including, including Zinoviev. 
This was the beginning of the liquidation of any kind of rank and file opposition, as up until then, Stalinist repression had mainly fallen on the ruling elites. One of the first Italians to run up against Soviet justice was Virgilio Verdaro. Imprisoned for defeatism in the First World War, he was close to the positions of Bordiga's Il Soviet. And by 1918, he was already coordinator in Tuscany for what would become the abstentionist communist fraction, which thanks to him had a sizable following. Thus, on January 15, 1921, he was amongst the founding members of the PCDI at the San Marco Theater in Livorno and became a member of the first Central Committee. In 1924, the party transferred him to the USSR, where he stayed in the notorious Hotel Lux. He was distrusted for being a militant of the left, and since he was critical of the policies of the party and the international, this was the period of Bolshevization, which was forced on the PCDI by Zinoviev of the Como Conference of the Congress of Lyon, the Committee of Intesa. From 1927, he was put under surveillance by the GPU. The Leninist ex Cheka, or rather the Committee Against Sabotage and Counter-Revolution, leader the NKVD, leader still the KGB. Sensing his own imminent arrest in 1931, he quickly fled the USSR with the aid of money collected by the Italian comrades. It was possible for his wife and companion, or it was impossible for his wife and companion, Emilia Mariottini, to follow him because she was pregnant. She was sacked from her job and thrown out of her lodgings when she refused to become a police spy and accuse her husband. Later, she lost her son and lived in extreme poverty until 1945, when she also managed to leave the country. Meanwhile, Verdaro settled in Belgium, where he was reunited with comrades of the fraction, often writing for its organ, Prometeo, under the pseudonym of Gato Mamon. From these columns, he would often denounce the policies of Stalinism. On the outbreak of war, he moved to his native Switzerland, where he lost contact with the other comrades, so much so that he joined the Tikkanese Socialist Party. He returned to Italy and died in Florence without ever coming back to revolutionary communist positions, in all likelihood proving once again, as they say, it is difficult to grow old with Marxism. Luigi Caligaris, probably an openly affiliated to the left until his expulsion, he sought refuge in the USSR in 1933 after five years of fascist imprisonment. Initially, he presided over the Moscow circle of emig emigre, where, as a rule, the political debates inside the emigre community took place. As such, these were kept under close surveillance by the GPU, which had many spies and infiltrators inside the group. After giving up courses at the Leninist University, he was removed from the, this position for his open and obstinate Bordigism. However, he still participated in the meetings where he formed a group of the left together with Alfredo Bonciani. Ezio Biondini, Rodolfo Bernetic, Giovanni Bel Belusic, Arnaldo Silva, Giuseppe Sensi, and the anarchists Otello Gaggi, or Gaggi and Gino Martelli. Along with the first four, in December 1934, he managed to get a letter to Brussels and Prometeo, organ of our fraction, with which they were in contact despite the political censorship. It spoke out against the political situation inside Russia, including the Communist Party. Thanks to the spies in Brussels, he was arrested not long after the appearance of the article in Prometeo, interrogated and tortured in order to extract the desired confession. Condemned to three years in the Gulag, leader increased while he was serving it. Apparently, he died of malnutrition in 1937. Marini, freed after 10 years in the Gulag but destroyed in spirit and still under surveillance, would ask a PCI delegation which was in Moscow at the time for a congress in the person of G. Pajetta to get him repatriated. The next day he was rearrested by the NKVD and condemned to another 10 years in the Gulag, ending up being killed by a common criminal in circumstances that were never clarified. Belusic and Bernetic were probably already shot by 1937. Gaggi and Martelli, who had been condemned in Italy to 20 and 30 years in prison respectively, 
perished inside the gulag. Bonciani was stabbed to death in the room where he lived by two Italian criminals. Accommodated, accommodated for the occasion at the House of the Revolution, a place of convalescence for old Bolshe Bolsheviks at the expense of the PCDI. Arrested by the Soviet justices, they were condemned to a good three months, and it's not even certain that they served the whole of this. The Stalinist prosecutors also maintained that he had been liquidated for his espionage activity, which had already been noted while he was in Italy. Silva had been imprisoned during the famous trial of Italian communists in 1923 and was renowned in the Italian milieu for managing to escape from the Regina Coeli prison by passing himself off as a lawyer who was visiting the detainees and afterwards poking fun at the prison governor in an open letter in the party press. In Russia from 1923, he became a colonel in the Red Army. He was shot in 1937 or 38. This group also enjoyed the sympathy and indirect support of Francesco Missiano, someone who was well known in his role as president of the International Workers' Aid and who would die from illness in the middle of 1936 a few weeks before. It now seems certain he was to be arrest, arrested by the GPU and Guido Pacelli, commanding officer of the Arditi in the celebrated battle of Ultra Torrente in Parma killed in a Spanish trench by a blow to the neck. Like many others, he had asked to go to Spain as a volunteer to escape from likely arrest in the USSR, from where, don't forget, it was impossible to emigrate. Once in Spain, he made contact with the Pum. Thus, from the spring of 1935, a series of articles denouncing the disappearance of these comrades appeared in Prometeo under the signature of Gato Mamon. The Caligaris case, where is Caligaris? Caligaris, ourselves, and centrism. We denounce the disappearance of Caligaris. <clears throat> this was the first denunciation of the crimes of Stalinism in history. The comrades of the fraction then decided to write an open letter to the CC of the Bolshevik party, a letter which received no reply. Again, in the first half of 1938, our comrades of the fraction published a list of about 20 missing comrades in Prometeo and denounced their detention, or worse, their physical liquidation. A young worker from Turin, Emilio Gornicelli, who emigrated to the USSR in 1932, was caught up in this affair. There is no evidence that he had any links with the left, but even he became involved in the trial of the Caligaris group and was sentenced to three years in Siberia, later doubled in preference to being expelled from the country and labeled an enemy of the Soviet people and of socialism. He was to die in Siberia. His story is instruct instructive because the Stalinists maintained for decades that he had been a spy in the service of the Italian embassy. Recent documents demonstrate that this was a complete lie. On the contrary, the ambassador received precise instructions from the ministry to abandon inquiring about his well-being from the Soviet authorities in the same way as with the vast majority of the Italian internees. Like many others, including Caligaris, Guarnicelli, whose passport had been taken away by the Soviet authorities and who was left abandoned by the Italian party, asked the Italian embassy for new documents so that he could be legally repatriated. That was enough to be classed as a spy. His story has only become known because his companion, Nella Masudi, who was herself interned for a time, had the correspondence with his family and herself published after the war as part of an initiative by Trotsky Trotskyists outside Italy. In Italy itself, it is only since the 70s that the official line has been treated with skepticism. Even the concluding sentence of one of his last letters that is quoted with malignant joy by all our anti-communists and those who accept the PCI's falsehoods. Comrades, we are mistaken. There is no socialism in the USSR. Is that of a young communist worker, albeit politically naive, who states that in the USSR there is no trace of socialism, that life is worse there than in Italy, but is certainly not written by someone who has ceased to believe in the possibility of socialism. It is a sign of how much his family were influenced by Stalinist propaganda, that at first they did not believe what he wrote about his experience and on the reality of the Soviet Union. 
Dante Cornelli, even if he was not completely with the left, it is important to draw comrades' attention to him. The communist militant who served more years than anybody. 24 years spent between the gulag and enforced exile, yet he managed to survive and devoted himself above all to publicizing what had happened to his comrades. In 1919, during the nationwide strike in solidarity with the Hungarian Council Republic, George Lucas, who was in exile at the time, had stayed with him, and then 20 years later he met him again whilst in detention in the USSR. In 1922, he fled from Tivoli after killing a fascist during the armed clashes that were taking place and found refuge in the USSR at the beginning of November that same year. He was in time to join the celebrations for the fifth anniversary of the revolution, or is that fifth? Fifth or 10th? The V. Oh crap. The V anniversary of the revolution. I marveled at the fact that there was no platforms for the authorities and that every simple militant could shake hands and chat, as he did with top level Bolsheviks, such as Trotsky and Bukharin, with whom, he re with whom he remained very close until his death. As a worker and member of the opposition, he was expelled from the Bolshevik party in 1927, only to rejoin two years later with Stalin's left turn that we mentioned earlier. After that, he went less and less often to the emigre circles, distrusting the leadership cult and atmosphere of suspicion which hung over them. In 1936, he was arrested. His experience of the justice system in Kafka is Kafkaesque. For example, the verdict against him was first passed on the same day that Italy declared war on the USSR, and so the terms of the sentence were delayed as in addition to the Trotskyist charge against him, he was now also convicted of being a fascist spy in the service of Mussolini. In 1970, he was able to return to Italy thanks to Umberto Terracini, a childhood friend who took up his case. From then on, for the next 20 years, he wrote many texts telling the story of the communists in the USSR, of the victims, of whom he compiled an alphabetical list of around 3,000 names, and the persecutors. No publisher brought out any of these, not even in the atmosphere of the new left in the 70s, so he was forced to print them at his own expense. According to his sister's account, later in life, it also appears, although this is not certain, that some of the manuscripts were taken from his house by unknown agents of the CIA, who were probably PCI functionaries. Only in 1978, and then only by La Pietra, a publisher in the orbit of the PCI, was Cornelli's diary of a resurrected Tibertino brought out, and even this was cut in places to fit the PCI's prevailing political line at the time. Only in 2000 would such texts be reprinted by the Liberal Foundation Publishing House, that hotbed of dangerous revolutionaries, such as Ramiri, Tranchetti Prevera, Della Valle, Galli Della Loggia, uh, Penebianca, and other similar people. The many public meetings he called in order to denounce his, and not only his, experience received scant attention. In 1978, he was invited by the television journalist Enzo Biaghi to debate with um, Rosio, and in, 1920, in 1982 was interviewed for La Repubblica by M. Maffei. He died effectively isolated and in great economic difficulty. 20 years earlier, the same sort of thing had happened to someone else from the province of Rome, Antonio Scariolo. When Stalin died, he returned to Italy, to Genzano in the province of Rome. After many years in the gulag and dared to speak of his experiences to comrades in the PCI. The upshot of this was that he was first regarded as mad and then sacked from the Red Collective, where he worked as a farm laborer, which meant he also lost the accommodation that went with the job. Cornelli is also significant for the eyewitness account he gives of Vorkuta. While most detainees were, were resigned to their fate and concentrated on surviving the shortages, the violence and daily duress that the terrible life in the camps imposed, yet others thought they had become victims by mistake 
and continued to have blind faith in the party and the little father, to whom hundreds of supplications were uh, for reviews of cases were directed daily. Cornelli, however, draws a vivid and admirable picture of how the self-proclaimed Trotskyist detainees, who were strong in their convictions and never tamed, many of them had already been detained for about a decade, represented a world apart. By various struggle tactics, such as work abstentions, hunger strikes, passive resistance, the governors in many camps had allowed them to live together in the same barracks, to form homogeneous work columns where comrades could help each other if one of them did not reach their individual production quota, which they had to do in order to receive enough rations to survive the Siberian climate, and thus to stay out of contact with the common criminals, the real bosses in the camps. Moreover, Cornelli again recalls these same people. After 10, 12, or even 14 hours labor in the Siberian cold of at least 30 degrees below freezing, they still found the will and time for endless nocturnal discussions on capitalism, the party, the class, collectivization, primary accumulation, Nazi fascism, democracy, etc. A number of them, almost always old Bolsheviks, had clandestine copies of books on Stalin's index of banned publications, the contents of which they would explain to the younger comrades. Furthermore, they had found the most ingenious means to develop a tight correspondence network with the detainees in other camps. One of the most famous of these was the Flying Newspaper, comprising a single article produced collectively, which the next comrades to be transferred from one camp to another would carry with them, hiding them behind buttonholes or inside their heavy fur hats in order to develop the debate on the most talked about subjects. When this system was discovered by, by the authorities, they started to memorize what they had to pass on to the comrades in the gulag that was to be their next destination. However, come 1937, all this finished. Life in the camps became palpably worse for everyone, and Cornelli remembers, in Varkuta alone, the nocturnal executions of Trotskyists continued over many consecutive nights. The survivors lost their privileges and were dispersed throughout the immense concentration camp universe. Vincenzo Bacala, ex-secretary of the Roman Federation of the PCDI, was arrested and shot in 1937 and remembered by his wife and companion Pia Piccioni, whose silent companion, a widow in Stalin's gulags, was one of the very first publications to appear after the war and was publicized in Battaglia Comunista. Incidentally, her account also confirms the validity of the left's position just after the murder of Matteotti. Bacala was in prison in Rome at the time, but was unexpectedly released upon the prison governor pensively asked. Oh, hold on. Released whereupon the prison governor pensively asked, what are you going to do now? While the centrist leadership of the PCDI embroiled the, embroiled the party in the suicidal and weakening tactic of parliamentary anti-fascism and support for the damaged democracy, the left maintained it could and should take the issue to the working class and appeal to the proletariat to check the fascist violence, given that this was the last chance to do so. The tactic they adopted was that of the so-called flying meetings, or rather of meetings held spontaneously outside the factory gates or in the popular districts to assess how far the workers were disposed to struggle. The responses, even though partial, were positive and encouraging. There was a desire to resist amongst the workers, and there could, could and should have been a call for the proletariat to struggle. Since nothing of the kind happened and there was no clear-cut call either to the party militants or the proletariat as a whole, the state apparatus was able to regalvanize and reorganize itself and the opportunity evaporated. And as Vicenzo Bacala records, or records, a few days later, he was quietly rearrested in his own house so that he had to finish his own sentence after which he departed for Russia. And Mundo Peluso, defined by the same bourgeois sources as the John Reed or the Che Guevara of the PCDI defined himself as a citizen of the world, having been born in Naples, gone to primary school in Spain, secondary school in America, and university in Germany and Switzerland. 
He worked as a journalist, laborer, fireman, and a thousand other things ranging from South America to the Philippines and Japan. He was a friend of De Leon, leader of the American Socialist Party, knew Clara Zetkin, Rosa Luxemburg, Kay Libnick, Radek, and even Laura Marx and Paul Lefargue in Paris. He was at Zimmerwald in 1915, where he held a centrist position along with all the Italian Socialist Party and was familiar with Lenin and the Bolshevik delegation. The year after, at Kienthal, he broke with the party discipline and abstained from voting for the centrist resolution which came out of this Congress, being more and more convinced of the theses of the left, Bolshevik and the Bremen and Hamburg group, later only regretting that he had only given his full support after October. In 1918 to 19, he took part in the Spartacist movement in Berlin. In 1920, he was a member of the abstentionist fraction and then part of the Italian delegation to the Fourth Congress of the International in 1922. He collaborated in the editing of pamphlets for the International, something Lenin had explicitly asked him to do, having described him a year earlier as one of the Italian party's most brilliant writers who can and must write three or four times more than he does at present in all the languages that he knows. He even took part in the Cantonese insurrection in China in 1927, which was bloodily repressed and which he was fortunate to survive. He was arrested for avoiding military service and for defeatism. He had never been in the army in Italy and was beaten up by fascists many times from 1921 onwards. He finally emigrated for the USSR in 1926. From then on, he kept a low profile, joining the Bolshevik party where, however, he doesn't seem to have been drawn in amongst the suspects or the spies. It also appears that he hardly ever went to the emigre circles meetings. He was arrested in 1938, interrogated and tortured to extract the confession which he never gave, which is why he wasn't shot until four years later. In general, those condemned to death were executed a few weeks after their sentence. Moreover, it is remarkable, considering that everybody, from Bukharin to Zinoviev, had confessed to everything. He could not escape the Gulag, for the simple reason that there was nowhere to go. For example, the Gulag of Karaganda in Central Asia alone extended over an area as large as the Netherlands today. The uninhabited Republic of Komi in Siberia, a single immense Gulag, which is as, which is as unknown to most people today as it was then, is 30% bigger than Italy. Gulags such as Karaganda and Verkuta appear to have accommodated up to 300,000 detainees each. If it's certainly not Marx's practice to take for gold everything asserted by the historiographies, it is, however, entirely part of Marx's method to consider the abnormalities they describe without resorting to idealist categories such as intrinsic human evil, madness, etc., etc. In class terms, it is a matter of a gigantic process of original accumulation of capital in an immense country, laying aside racial, religious, geographical factors, etc., which, under the weight of foreign competition and the impact of the 1929 crisis, had to concentrate into a few years what other countries had taken decades or centuries to bring about. It was a gigantic extortion of absolute surplus value. The concentration camp system was based on metal extraction for heavy industry, clearing forests and the opening up of virgin island or virgin land in immense uninhabited territories and the creation of a roadway infrastructure. Even today in central Siberia, there exists the so-called skeleton highway, or rather the 2000 kilometers of road, which crossed through the regions under which the frozen bones of hundreds of thousands of corpses are interred. When, for example, technicians were needed to open up a new mine or an, o or an oil well, another Trotskyist fascist plot and various other acts of sabotage were conveniently discovered, with the culprits being precisely the professionals who were needed, and thus they were dispatched to work for nothing. Meanwhile, the internees themselves realized that a week's work by a hundred people could have been done in a day or two with a tractor. One Italian ex-deportee, a Stalinist to the core, observed, I was only sorry to have gone to the Colima mines, escorted by the police and in handcuffs, as if I was an enemy of the people. If they had asked me, appealing to my spirit of internationalism, I would certainly have gone voluntarily. Anonymous from Italian, Italians in Stalin's camps. 
Finally, two words on the prosecutor or the persecutors before the next generations can and do definitively throw them as they deserve into the dustbin of history. Aside from the already mentioned Urkali Togliotti, there was a whole strata of leaders, the various Dozas, Grecos, Bertis, Germanettos, Pastorists, and uh, Rosios. The latter was initially close to the left and therefore was not was that much more zealous with his later persecutions, who were even active in Spain, where they carried out their duty their dirty duties, assassinating opponents from the left and contributing to the suffocating of the most genuine aspirations of the Spanish proletariat.